We will stand in line and... Hello and welcome to a rather windy edition of Rise With Us, where we're talking to top athletes and fitness experts to find out what makes them tick and keeps them motivated. We'll be digging for insights into some of their biggest achievements, but also finding out about their little day-to-day -day wins, bringing you top tips from the normal lives of some rather extraordinary and successful people, all to help us rise up to our day-to-day -day challenges. And on Rise With Us today is a British jockey whose star has been on a rapid rise. From Pony Club member to record breaker, she continues to push the boundaries of her sport, riding her first winner aged 17 to setting a new record in 2019 for winners ridden in a British season by a female jockey. Despite the impact of a global pandemic, 2020 saw her break her own record for the most winners in a calendar year by a female jockey. And her achievements at the highest level include her first Royal Ascot success, followed up with five winners on a single card at Windsor and a Champions Day double at Ascot. Her outstanding accomplishments on the track have also been recognised away from it, with awards such as the Sunday Times Sportswoman of the Year, the Sports Journalist Association Sportswoman of the Year and Flat Jockey of the Year. A lot of history made by the age of just 24 and no signs of that slowing down. It is, of course, the one and only Holly Doyle. Holly, welcome to Rise With Us. We just heard some of the incredible things that you've already achieved in your career. I've, I've got to ask, first of all, what motivates you? Um, the thing that probably motivates me the most is winning. Um, you know, I buzz off riding winners and, you know, I just love riding horses. <laughs> you've ridden a fair few horses and a fair few winners, it has to be said. Um, have you always had that, that innate motivation? What is it that really gets you out of bed in the morning and, and onto the horses bright and early? I probably grown up you know being ultra competitive and you know competing in loads of different sports and yeah I think it runs in the family the competitiveness but um, I just I, I just love my job really and um, you know riding winners motivates me and I just want to be better and do better the whole time. You've achieved so much in your career already and a lot of it as well in the last year which has been challenging for all of us of course in the midst of a global pandemic the fact that in 2019 you set a record for for winners ridden by a, a British female and you broke it in a year where there wasn't that much going on. Um, is that something that motivates you to, to set records and be beating records or is that just a byproduct of, of winning I a lot? To be honest, I don't really set numerical targets at all, but obviously being an athlete, it, you always want to better what you've done the previous year and um, you know, it's going to get hard for me at some point, but um, no, I just kind of walk into each year with try and be as positive as I can and um, make myself mentally and physically in the right frame of mind. How did you manage to keep motivated then that last year when you know initially that first lockdown everything stopped including racing what, what did you do to, to keep yourself going really and, and focus? Um, I just probably transferred all the um, you know the, we, we obviously weren't able to go racing and ride ride races every day so um, I just tried to train as hard as I could and just make use of that time that we don't have really in the season to try and make myself better and um, you know use it to get as fit as I can and be ready for when we could come back. So you didn't give in to temptation and give yourself a bit of a banana bread break like the rest of us? Not really, I, I'm not very good at switching off and relaxing so I, I got quite into um, doing a lot of different things which probably probably kept you quite quite sane mentally I suppose. What sort of different things were you doing? Um, just wow, we, made, we made our own little gym in the garage and um, we took up cycling. Um, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's not up my street but I did it because I realised how beneficial it was for my riding but um, yeah we just really kept busy. If you couldn't be in one saddle you'd be in another. Yeah. Switch one for the other then. Um, what are your personal highlights when you look back at the last two years of your career? Because by anyone's measure, they have been an extraordinary couple of years. Um, probably the first time I ever rode 100 winners because I was just in complete disbelief. You know, Growing up, I always wanted to be a jockey and I knew in my, my head what I wanted to do and achieve, but I never thought I'd be good enough or it would be possible. Um, 
So when I rode 100 winners, I was just pretty gobsmacked. Um, and then obviously you get a taste of that and you want to do it again and again. So it just motivated me even more once I got a taste of the success. Does it add any extra pressure on yourself? Like you said, you know, you get your 100 winners. Last year you rode 151, I think, obviously going well so far this year. Do, do you feel more pressure or do you just keep doing what you're doing? Um, I'm probably quite tunnel visioned and I know what I want to do and I know what I need to do. Um, as long as I keep focused and keep on the right path um, and doing what I'm doing, I just hope the right rides come about because um, unless you're riding the right horses, you can't ride winners. <laughs> that is very true, but you're getting more and more rides offered all the time. Is, is it getting to a point where you have almost too many to choose from? No, no, <laughs> not at all. It's, um, you know, I just want to ride as many horses and as many winners as possible. We've of course got you breaking records and, and really flying the flag, flag for, for young jockeys and female jockeys in flat racing. It's the same in jumping too. We had Rachel Blackmore winning the, Nas uh, the Grand National this year, which is a huge achievement. Just how much of an exciting time is this for female jockeys generally? Um, it's pretty awesome really, especially Rachel winning the um, Grand National. It's you know one of the world's toughest races to win um, and she's just I think she's just shut the door on the whole conversation really about female riders. It's just, um, I think the conversation's been broken down a bit. You know, the evidence is there. You know, the results are proven now. Well, across, across all equestrian sports, it's one of the few sports that historically has, has seen men and women competing on a, on a level playing field, but there have still been these questions around it. Do you think we are past that now when it comes to racing in, in, in all forms? Um, I feel like, yeah, we are, and within the industry, and within the wearing room, it's not an issue and it doesn't get brought up. But I suppose from the outside looking in, from the wider public's point of view, it is spoken about quite a lot and rightly so, I suppose. Um, but within our industry, I, th I think um, the argument's pretty settled at the moment. <laughs> in your mind, do you see yourself as a female jockey or is it just you're a jockey? Um, I just see myself as a jockey. I get a bit offended sometimes when I get um, kind of singled out for being a female jockey. Yeah, that makes sense because you're competing at the same yeah. level with it, with everyone else. We ha we will always add that word though when it comes to the records because yeah. you're the first one to do it, so <laughs> yeah. we kind of have to. Um, how important is it that we make racing inclusive for everyone, especially when we're having younger jockeys coming through like yourself and really making a mark? Yeah, I think it's really important. You know, growing up when I was 16, um, coming into the weighing room and into the industry, I, I kind of felt like I couldn't go up to people and ask questions and talk. Um, about certain things so I just wouldn't want anyone to feel like they can't talk to me when I become older or you know I, I want to be approachable and I feel like um, people need to be a bit more approachable. If we talk a little bit about goal setting and your support I know your goal is just to ride as many horses as you can and to ride winners but with the, the records you set and the, and the records you break, how aware have you been of these records being, you know, there, like you're, you're one winner away from breaking this record or, or, or that kind of thing? Is it something you're aware of at the time or do you not let it into your brain? Um, I'm not really aware of it. It sounds really bad, but um, unless I was, unless they were highlighted, I wouldn't know I've done it, to be honest, because I didn't know they were there to be broken. Um, but no, I suppose it's great. and. It's nice. <laughs> on that day in Windsor where you rode five winners on a single card, which was a record, when you went into that fifth race, did anyone say to you that you were on to, to break a record if you, if you got that winner? No, it wasn't mentioned. I didn't know I had broken any type of record. I think um, Richard Hughes actually rode the whole card, you know, went through the whole card, so I'm thinking I'd like to do that one day. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just... Um, you know, no matter how well I've done, I always think well, I could have done a bit better. <laughs> Spoken like a true athlete and perfectionist, that's for sure. Um, what is your goal in terms of your sort of legacy within the sport? And that's a strange question to ask when you're so early on in your career, but what, what goals have you set for yourself in what you achieve and, and what legacy you leave? Um, I just, I don't know, I'd like to kind of inspire people coming into the industry. And um, I suppose I've got to where I've got not through being majorly talented, just through kind of keeping my head down and working on through it. And, um, you, you know, it goes to show that you don't need to be given something or put on a platform before you've even started. You can get somewhere if you really want it. 
I agree with that sentiment, but I will object to you saying you're not majorly talented, Holly. <laughs> you... I wasn't. <laughs> to begin well, you've with, worked, right? Um, I had to work hard, and and I and I eventually got better. But you know, I never, you know, when I when I first started out, I wasn't, um, you know, great. <laughs> I'm sure you had talent from a young age. You were obviously a, a pony clubber, like yeah, many club. many young riders yeah, are in this yeah, country. Um, what was it like when you were in, in Pony Club? What was the sort of mix like with, of girls and boys? And how has that changed as you stepped into being a professional jockey? Um, well, in the Pony Club, there were, it was mainly girls and there were only a handful of boys. You know, my brother was, you know, rode alongside me and um, I used to do everything, you know, show jumping, cross country. But once I um, got my leg over a race in Pony, I, I kind of lost interest in everything and became fixated on racing and I dropped everything else. <laughs> What was it about racing that just lit something inside you? I don't know, probably the need for speed and yeah, <laughs> you've just got to be ultra competitive, haven't you? When was it that you went from going, this is really fun, I like riding horses really, really fast, to thinking this is something I could actually do as a career? Um, from the mo well, from a, for as long as I can remember, really. Um, I'd never had any kind of other options in my head or gave myself a chance to want to be or do anything else. <laughs> which is not great but it worked out all right so far it's paying off so far that sort of that tunnel vision um what sort of goals did you set for yourself if any in your you know first year say as a as a professional full-time jockey um well when i lost my claim i think i went through my apprenticeship thinking that it would get maybe a little bit easier when i became professional but um kid you not it is you know it gets 10 times harder because you've got to be just as good as the rest of them you know you don't have that claim there to kind of um give you you know give a trainer um an incentive to use you so you you have to make yourself better for those of our viewers who aren't quite into horse racing as much what do you mean by claim um so when you're an apprentice um you obviously i i left school i didn't go to college or university i i um i had an apprenticeship as an as a jockey so you start out with a seven pound claim um, which means you can claim seven pounds off the horse's weight that it carries so that gives your boss or other trainers um, a reason to want to use you because your horse will carry less weight um, and you you lose your you I think you lose your seven pound after 20 winners and your five pound after 50 and then I think it might be 95 winners and you're in a, and you're a professional how did you cope then you know like you say with the challenge of, of losing that claim and knowing you had to compete that bit harder and work that bit harder how did you approach that challenge um i uh, i kind of thought that i'd be done with you know i thought people wouldn't want to use me when i lost my claim and which 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 is what motivated me to get better and work harder because i knew that it wouldn't be easy mm. um so i think you've got to kind of be focused in that that department is that something you kind of find as a, a personal strength you see a challenge and you, you you use that to motivate you rather than put you off or make you nervous or scared of it um yeah I think so I think um some of the hurdles I've you know come you know had to overcome have kind of made me a bit more motivated and stronger and I kind of don't sit down and mope about it I just use it as a reason to want to be better I like it just that get up get on with attitude you left home at 16 to, to pursue full-time racing. How difficult was that and, and how supportive were your family of you taking that leap and, like you say, not going to college or university? Um, I think from the age of 13, 14, that was always going to be the plan, really, to go and be an apprentice. Um, it's not something that I thought about or got upset about. I did remember my last day at school and I packed my bags and I was away and my parents were like, fair enough, and they encouraged me. So Yeah, there was nothing stopping you, really? No, nothing. Um, do you set any sort of goals in your personal life it seems like when it comes to your racing you're quite level-headed you're quite focused at doing what you you want to do would you let your personal life be an area where you sort of relax and <laughs> don't set um, too many aims yeah I try to relax when we have the time but I you know racing is a lifestyle really it's not something that you know you, you get home at five o'clock and you have time to yourself it's 24 7 so you just have to try and find ways to I don't know deal with things <laughs> whilst you're doing it. <laughs> Your partner, Tom Marquand, is, is also a flat racing jockey, so you're in the, the same field, similar lifestyle. That's got to be an advantage, right, I imagine, in terms of, of how you, you manage everything. Because like you say, it's 24-7, you have very little downtime, but having a partner that is in the same industry, that must help. I think it helps massively, really. I mean, we both 
rub off each other's motivation and um, we, we egg each other along and, um, you know, I, I always kind of look, you know, look up to want to be as good as Tom or, or vice versa, I don't know, but uh, it's definitely helped. Do you get, ever get competitive with each other? Um, not really. Not There's really. not a tally chart at home as to who's had the most no. winners for the season. No. One in your head? Not really. <laughs> You've already achieved a lot of success already. Do you have an awareness or an idea in mind of what more you could achieve or, or want to achieve? Yeah, I wanna, I've got so much more that I want to achieve. I, hopefully I'm just at the tip of the iceberg of what I want to do one day, but um, I've got a long way to go. I'm only 24 and I've got a lot to learn <laughs> and um, you know a lot of improvements that can be made, which is good, I suppose. And, just have to see. That's the advantage of all equestrian sports, really, isn't it? You can have a, a really long career, unlike a lot of other sports where, you know, 24, once you get to your late 20s, it, it, you're kind of almost there. What is it you'd like to achieve? Can you tell us about some of those goals? Um, I really love to ride a classic winner and ride more Group 1 winners. You know, that's the um, ultimate ambition. But I know full as, um, you know, I realise how hard it is to come across horses of that uh, status. <laughs> you've had a lot of success off the track as well. You've won awards within your sport. You've won awards in wider sport representing, you know, horse racing. What does that mean to you? Um, it means the world, really. I, you know, I'd never thought that anything would have been recognised outside of the racing industry. And um, when we were younger and Tom was nominated for the Young Sports Personality of the Year Award, I was kind of a bit you know, starstruck when we were walking around with all these um, amazing athletes and I just never could um, envisage myself being good enough or in a position to be nominated for anything like that. So it was just a bit mad, really. Well, when you were nominated for Sports Personality last year, the racing world really rallied around you. The hashtag Vote Holly with the beanie yeah. was trending everywhere. That support must have been um, really quite impressive and I imagine quite humbling for you as well, seeing the rest of your sport rally around you. Yeah, I suppose that's the best way to describe it. It's humbling. It was just nice to know that everyone was happy, happy for me and um, rooting for me. I know you still have a very sort of, just from talking to you, a very level-headed way of looking at everything, but you are becoming very much a sort of, you know, a celebrated jockey and some people really look to it and, you know, you're watched quite closely in what you're doing and the winners you're getting. Do you have any sense of where you are in the bigger picture of the racing world or do you have to stay quite blinkered? Um, I suppose I am quite blinkered. I, you know, don't feel nothing. I don't feel like anything's changed for me. You know, my home life hasn't changed at all in the last five years, but I suppose from the outside looking in, um, there's been a big change. <laughs> Do you think that's maybe part of your success as well? And the fact that home life, it's the same as it's always been. And you've, you've got that really important grounding amongst your, your family and with Tom. Um, yeah, probably. I think my parents brought me up pretty well to kind of, um, keep me level headed and not get too carried away with things because ultimately all I wanted to be all I want to be is a good jockey and that's it. Do you ever kind of think to yourself you know 13 year old you knew where 24 year old you is and, and, and going what she might think of it all? Um, yeah it'd be pretty unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs>
can just get on with it. <laughs> I suppose you've got to keep your energy levels up mm. as well, haven't you? If you've got a, a full race card or you're at an evening meeting, do you eat a lot beforehand or do you not want to have too much because you don't want to feel yeah, too full? Yeah, I don't really like eating too much beforehand. I just try and nibble away in between races and then have something on the way home. Do you, do you see food as, as fuel or fun? Like, I guess from what you're saying, it's very functional because you're always on the go. Uh, a bit of both, really. I mean, I, I'm a bit of a foodie, so um, when I get to in, in, enjoy a meal out, I make the most of it. But um, it is important to fuel yourself with the right things, I suppose. How much of a help is it living with someone who is also a, a, an athlete? You know, I know you're both busy and, and all over the place, but do you cook and eat the same things together when you can? How does that work? Um, well, I, I'm lucky, really, because Tom absolutely loves cooking and oh, he's pretty good. So um, whenever we're at home, he, he takes it upon himself to want to cook something, which is nice. And um, I usually let him, him do that because he does have to watch his weight a lot more than me. So if he's choosing what we have, then it can't be my fault if he wakes up heavy. <laughs> and you can't be there scarfing down all, all the treats if he's got to yeah. be a bit more careful. Wouldn't be the kindest thing, would it? Um, when you do get to travel, no, none of us have been travelling much recently. When you do get to travel to different countries to ride, do you try different things when you're out there? Do you like trying new cuisines and new food? Yeah, I love, you know, trying new things. Um, yeah, it's what make, makes a journey worth it, doesn't it? What is your favourite meal in the world? Um, pretty boring, really. Probably a good steak. <laughs> and would that be with mashed potatoes or chips? I want, I want details. <laughs> um, usually with vegetables or chips or something. It's okay. pretty normal. <laughs> okay. Any sauce? Ah, uh, peppercorn. Be all right. Good choice. Good choice. Now I've heard, and this is a bit of a sidestep here. I've heard that you can jump from standing your whole height. You can jump as high as as you are. So that's just under under five foot. How? Did you train yourself to do that? What is the secret rocket fuel to having that, that strength? Um, I'm not too sure. It's something I've worked on over a long, a long period of time that um, obviously got better in, in time. But like I said, I'm, I'm lucky that I can afford to put on weight by a muscle mass. And um, that's, I think that's, that's a big help. How much of an advantage is that, that wiggle room that you have that a lot of jockeys don't in that you can add some, some muscle and some strength? Because you're riding some big horses. Um, I mean, it is an advantage, but also I am very small in comparison to everybody else. And a lot of trainers can sometimes think, oh, well, I'm, I'm too small. So that's something that um, from growing up as a kid I, has, has motivated me and given me the drive to prove people wrong, really, and prove that I am I'm strong enough and I, am, I, I could be just as good as everyone else. Does that motivate you as well to make sure that you are working on muscle strength and maintaining some, some extra sort of mass and physicality there? That's what motivates me, really, yeah. It's, again, it's proving people wrong with you, isn't it? Yeah, there are a lot of people that need proven wrong, I suppose, you know, um, <laughs> but I don't mind doing that. In my head now, you have a list of people to prove wrong, and every time you do it, you <laughs> tick one off. Is that, is that the case? Um, You've got a wrong journal? No, no one in particular, it's probably myself giving these, uh, <laughs> these aims. No, I get it, though, I get it. You, if, you, if you feel like people are telling you you can't do something, you want to do it even more. Um, let's talk about, then, your, your schedule. You mentioned that, you know, you're up 5 30 6 o'clock to ride out you can be riding and racing till 8 30 at night i imagine you sleep pretty well when you finally hit that pillow yeah i sleep pretty well sometimes better than others but um because because i've been in the industry from such a young age it's something i've got used to and it's i don't know any different um you know for example if i have a day off i i really am very unsettled and i don't know what to do with myself so i end up going and doing a lot and then being even more tired the next day. But it's um, a bit of a vicious circle, but I, I usually feel most content when I'm actually at the races riding. Do you ever have it because, you know, I'm assuming after you've done a few races of evening, you must be pretty pumped and that adrenaline must be going. Do you ever get home and, and need to do anything to sort of wind yourself down or can you switch off pretty quickly? Um, it is sometimes hard to switch off because usually going in, in, into the you know, race me and you can sometimes feel a bit tired and drink you've been up so early but once it once I get riding I feel great and usually on the way home I feel really energized which isn't great because you're getting home late and you have to go to bed um but yeah you, my body's pretty adapted to it now so do you have any tricks you do like when you get home for example to wind yourself down or do you just literally need to get into bed no I literally I get through the front door and I go straight up upstairs to bed it's a bit weird but I that's what works for me. That's whatever works. On the other side of that, like you say, if you get to a meeting and you are a bit tired, is there anything you do in addition to just getting on that, that horse? Is, that, is it a coffee? Is it a little word with yourself? Anything? 
Um, I usually, you know, try and do a few stretches and have a coffee or something just to wake myself up, but I'm absolutely fine once I get on the back of a horse. They do say that a stretch is just as good as a 20 minute nap. <laughs> there you go, a little fact for you. Um, you don't get a lot of time off as a jockey. We, we know that it is relentless. What do you do when you do get that precious window of time where you can have more than, more than a day to yourself? Um, we usually get a week off in November and a week off in March and we usually try and go away somewhere um, because otherwise you're at home thinking about racing and horses and you know I find the only way I really switch off properly is if I'm at the country on, on, on holiday so we usually try and go away somewhere. There were some lovely pictures on your social media of you and Tom away at the end of last year. You got engaged as well, I believe. So, so huge congratulations for that. Um, when you travel, what is it that you, you do? Do you literally lie by a beach and read books? Do you make sure you keep active or is it total switch off? Um, we try and totally switch off for a couple of days, but we also like going skiing and that's the complete opposite, isn't it? But it's, <laughs> it's just great to do something different, I, I suppose. Is riding a horse still relaxing for you if you just hack out? Because that's why you fell in love with the sport, right? The, the, the sort of basics that everyone does. Is that something you can still do for fun? Um, I don't really ride horses outside of racing, really. I ride them out in the mornings, but I, I don't really go out on hacks or anything. <laughs> when you do have a day off then, you, know, you said you, you fill it and you're even more tired. What do you fill it with? What is a relaxing day off for Holly Doyle? Um, well, I usually have to work in the morning anyway, ride out and... I try and go to the gym for a bit and um, get jobs done that I haven't been able to do. <laughs> Life admin then, yeah, the boring stuff. Yeah. But hey, it sets you up again. Um, establishing yourself as, as a jockey is tough. You can't really say no. How do you manage that, and especially you know a couple of years ago, and how do you manage that now in, in sort of making sure you're, you're saying yes to every opportunity but not burning yourself out entirely so that you can't perform? Um. It, it is hard to keep on top of things and to keep everyone happy and that's something that I try and prioritise is keeping everyone happy which sometimes isn't the best thing for yourself but um, like I'm many young so it's something I can afford to, uh, to do at the moment whilst I'm doing well. Is that something you're kind of aware of as well that at some point you might have to start saying no and, and, and um, letting some people not down but just sort of putting boundaries in? Maybe. I just don't feel like I'm in a position at the moment where I can do that and maybe one day I, I will be, but um, I'm, I'm not going to turn down any opportunities at the moment. Why is it that horse racing is so unrelenting? I'm not really sure. I suppose there's so many different variables. You know, you're self-employed as a jockey, so you've, you've got to make a living for yourself and then your trainer's employed by owners, basically, so they've got to keep them happy. It's just... Um, there are, there are a lot of different variables yeah, involved. A lot of moving parts. Yes, everyone's yeah. got a lot, lot in the game. You, you know, you don't have a lot of control over your schedule. You can be anywhere in the country depending on what racing's happening where. How do you manage that level of uncertainty, sort of, you know, not really knowing where you're going to be next week? Because that, for me, is literally my worst nightmare. So I'm fascinated how you um, deal with that. Well, we, we don't know where we're going until, um, you know, 24 hours, really. Um, I don't know, it's wherever you go in the country, it's the same thing you're doing. So, you know, you could be in Scotland riding, but you're still riding, you know, you're getting there doing the same job and riding horses. So I suppose it doesn't really matter where it is. You, you just get up and do the same thing. It is a lot of travel time, though, a lot of time in the car. Is, is that your sort of, I don't know, is that your personal time in a way when you're in the car on your own driving to and from different courses is that when you actually have a little bit of space um yeah i suppose so the worst part about the job is the driving and the traveling but you can't do anything about that so you, you've just got to get on with it but um yeah i suppose it's a time where you, where you can use to you know call your family or something well yeah do you, do you spend that do you fill that time with with phone calls or do you listen to podcast music what do you do when you're on the road for hours um yeah i suppose i make a few phone calls and listen to podcasts in the radio I'm guessing as well that this is, you know, this is a question we ask everyone, that as a jockey, you are very much an early bird morning person and not a night owl, given any any variables in your schedule. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We've talked a lot about how you don't have a lot of time to slow down, but when you have to physically slow down, what do you do to force yourself to just take a, a breath? 
I am. I just try and chill out, really, and let my body recover because I suppose you're doing all this training and riding out and racing that your body's on the go and, you know, normal athletes train and then have recovery, but we don't. So it's quite important to let yourself recover. And what do you do to aid that recovery? Um, I just, like I said, I just try and chill out, really, and um, have hot baths and just normal things. The bath is always, always a winner. Holly Doyle, thank you so much for joining us on Rise With It. Thank you. Sky Sports, feel it all.